The next session is Beyond Frugal. Is India finally ready to move up value chain? Ladies and gentlemen, this session is in partnership with GE Healthcare. Please join me in welcoming our esteemed group of panelists, Mr. Amitabh Khan, CEO Niti Aayog. He'll be joining us shortly. Dr. Rajiv Bilal, Founder, Managing Director and CEO, IDFC Bank. Mr. Milan Rao, President and CEO, GE Healthcare India and South Asia. And as our esteemed moderator, we have Mr. Omkar Goswami, Founder and Chairman, CERG Advisory Private Limited. Over to you, sir. Thank you very much. You're very impressive. Uh, unfortunately, uh, Amitav uh, has not been able to come in yet, presentation to him. He may come, I hopefully he will come, because he'll have lots to say. But if he doesn't, we'll pretend he's there and continue with it. So, the, the theme is going beyond frugal. And really the question is, in 2006, does India have the wherewithal, or can it have the wherewithal in the very near future for it to do the production, that is the manufacturing part of it, as well as offer services which are not simple plain vanilla stuff, but, but more complicated, requires greater skills, much greater technological input, and goes up the value chain in a way in which you not only produce services and manufacturers which are up the value chain, but you produce it in a manner which consumers, irrespective of where they come from, consider it attractive and affordable. So are we going beyond frugal? Have we already started going beyond frugal, both in manufacturing and services? And I want to open that up later to, and what does this mean in terms of employment? Because at the end of the day, uh, we all talk about what it does to business, what it does to um, the profits of a company, what it does to consumers, but we don't talk much about what it does to employment. Uh, it seems to have disappeared from our lexicon, employment, and I do want to talk about that. Right now, a good idea, we have two different people. Milin is in looking at medical and healthcare for GE, and it's a huge business for GE. Go to any hospital, and God help you if you have to have a scan or an MRI, nine times out of 10, you'll be lying down with, under a GE machine. Um, and we have Rajiv, who has moved from being a foremost lender of, to infrastructure and do term loans to becoming one of the two new banks on the block along with Bandhan Bank. He is the managing director and CEO of IDFC Bank. So let me, let me start with, so, and it's very interesting because Milind is gonna talk about what are the possibilities in manufacturing and Rajiv on what are the possibilities in financial sector services of going beyond the bread and butter stuff and offering things up the value chain. So Milind, if you could speak for five minutes and then Rajiv and then we'll open up the conversation. So I think, uh, uh, thanks Omkar and uh, good morning to all of you. Um, often, you know, the entire discussion in such a forum typically tends to start with a campaign which is called Make in India. Uh, and while it is very topical, I think uh, uh, there is a lot of work which has been done around Make in India and around how you can create an infrastructure and an end-to-end -end value chain around making in India. And I think that's very, very important. And often, the discussion on make in India typically tends to come around to, you know, what are you manufacturing, right? Whereas the true question that we often look at, uh, and certainly from being a multinational who's been invested in India for over 100 years, uh, what is it that we do to create the capability to manufacture in the country as well as for manufacturing outside of the country. 
So I'm going to present uh, three different thoughts to you, which is part of the value chain of Make in India. The first one is that whenever you envisage a product, whenever you envisage creating something which is relevant to the market, in our case, to healthcare, to medical equipment, you often have to put in a lot of time and effort in trying to diagnose what is it that you wish to create, how is it going to be positioned in the market, and how are the trends going on globally which impact that. Uh, and therefore, the focus on R&D has to be tremendous. Before we get into any sort of manufacturing capability, so supposing, let's take the example of um, a revolution CT that we've created for India, CT scanner. The work which is done behind the CT scanner, which got launched about nine months ago, started four and a half years ago in 2011. We got together a team of about, so the idea was that CT scans are very, very expensive. How do we make sure that there is a CT scanner which is available en masse, which can be put in, into nursing homes, smaller hospitals across the country? And, you know, the huge impact of trauma, uh, you know, and a host of other things which can be uh, identified using a CT scanner. So we got together a team of about 100 doctors. We work together on what all are the things that they really need behind a CT scan, which will take into account 90% of the work which is done for scanning. And how can we make sure that those things are easily delivered to customers who are far away? Now, what all does this involve? This involves a looking at the demographic profile of uh, what is actually required by the patients who are coming in by looking at the actual work of what does a CT scanner do in various hospitals around the country. Uh, it's looking at what are the kind of workflows that are going on in the hospitals, what impacts the cost, the landed cost to a patient. So our cost is only one cost, which is creating a cost to the scanner, but how does the landing cost get impacted? And therefore, all the research has to be done around that. There has to be research done around clinical applications. So the doctors involved for the last, you know, maybe three years or four years in development have to give inputs behind all of that. And then once you take all of those inputs, you've got to create it into a design which is optimal. This entire process, which often gets, you know, overlooked or negated, is actually the fundamentals building block of really what manufacturing has to be. So that's important. The second one is, once you've got the design created, you start looking at, do we have the capability to source this equipment? Because oftentimes the assumption is that, you know, you set up a manufacturing capability and you can produce anything that you want. The reality, in fact, is contrary. It's exactly the opposite. That the supply chain is actually more important to set up prior to setting up of a manufacturing facility. So how do you make sure that the right supply chain, which is required, it may be for casting, forging, electrical, electronic components, software development, et cetera, et cetera. All of those have to be put together, and then you are able to create a platform for the manufacturer. And then the third part comes in of putting in the line, uh, which is plant and equipment and machinery. So the important thing is how do we look at the concept of Make in India from the perspective of all these three things which are the building blocks of first creating Make in India. And lastly, I would say is, do you have the people who are skilled at operating the plants and operating the machines at the end customer level? Because oftentimes, a lot of people create products which are not used to their optimal requirement in a hospital kind of scenario. So I think that's the first thing is that manufacturing is not about the actual act of manufacturing, but it's about creation of an ecosystem which will support the manufacturing, and often that is a very long-term process. The second point I wanted to make was, uh, in conjunction with the topic now, is that it's important, while it is important, we are in a global economy today, while it is important for us to create for India, and, and a lot of the problems in India are problems which are there for emerging markets across the world. So there is access, there is infrastructure, there is affordability, so we often call them, you know, the A's of the medical industry. You know, how do you make sure that you have uh, the awareness, the access, and the affordability? 
So it's important for us to therefore uh, figure out that what you create in a country should typically be used in other locations around the world as well. And I would like to therefore put forth an argument that let us, while it is very important to support things which are important, extremely important to the country, those very things are replicable across the world and we need to be at a level and a standard which is right for our products to be sent to different locations in the world. If I'm creating a CT scanner or I'm creating a PET, which is only going to be used in India, ultimately the scale does not work out for us to only create something for India. So I would strongly recommend that whenever we look at manufacturing, even frugal manufacturing, and our affordable care portfolio is pretty much around frugal manufacturing, it has to be competitive at a level of quality and it's got to have a scale that makes us competitive across the world. Because we're not doing something which is for the next one, two or three years, we're creating capabilities for the next 10, 20 years and beyond. And therefore we have to be competitive in a global scenario. So I, I, I'd say those two major directional points. Thanks, I'll, I'll, it's very useful, I'll come back to some of it later. Uh, Small announcement, I've just been told that uh, Mr. Amitav Kant is on his way, so that's good because then we'll have him here. So Rajiv, just uh, take us through your ideas of going up the value chain and going up the value chain by being cleverly frugal but offering a larger suite of, suite of services in the financial sector. You now have a wonderful situation where you have a clean slate in front of you in many ways, and what are the kind of things you are thinking of? So I will certainly address your question, but uh, before I do that, I had a couple of other observations. Um, so it will be, I think, a good segue from uh, what we just heard from Mr. Rao. Uh, <clears throat> first, I again have basically three points to make. The, the, the third one is about uh, financial services and uh, uh, how we can go beyond frugal in financial services. But the first point uh, is really uh, 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 on uh, the debate around uh, Make in India. Um, I think if you've uh, followed the discussions on Make in India, there is, uh, there are at least two schools of thought there are those uh, amongst our uh, tribe of fellow economists, Omkar, who keep arguing that India has now an opportunity to replicate what China did 30 years ago by encouraging doing whatever is necessary to make large-scale manufacturing happen in low value added. And that is with an eye to job creation. Now, we, we, we all know what China managed to achieve. Uh, we know that in this segment, we can do much, much better than we have. The share of manufacturing in GDP is much more modest than it ought to be for a country at our stage of development. Um, but there are two uh, uh, realities uh, that have emerged over the last decade. The first is the pace of technological change globally is such that uh, uh, we will not be able to replicate the employment intensity that China was able to achieve, even if we were to follow that policy of encouraging low value added manufacturing. Because even in the lowest value added manufacturing segments of industry, technology is replacing people at an astonishing pace. So it's going to be challenging, not that we shouldn't uh, uh, encourage the development of low man, uh, uh, value added manufacturing, but to expect that that is going to be the silver bullet that delivers job creation, I think is too ambitious an expectation. So that's the, uh, the, the first point. Second point I wanted to make is that uh, actually, for a variety of reasons, the sweet spot in manufacturing uh, for India, in terms of its competitive positioning internationally, is actually knowledge-intensive manufacturing. 
So if you look at engineering, uh, you look at companies um, that are involved in auto components and so on, it's actually our ability to embed ourselves in global supply chains in industries that require a level of engineering and intellectual sophistication, intellectual, embodied intellectual sophistication, where we have been extremely successful. Life sciences is another, is another example, actually, of precisely that. Um, and that's for historical reasons. I mean, we have managed to um, underinvest in infrastructure, um, where our labor laws are, are what they are, and therefore it's hard for us to compete with Bangladesh in low-end garment manufacture, but we actually do very well in auto components. Uh, equally as important as job creation is export revenues. And it is vital for us strategically to remain embodied in global supply chains, and therefore it is extremely important not to discourage, in fact, to encourage uh, our ability to actually participate in higher value added manufacturing. And from where we are starting, we are actually, uh, you know, uh, at a competitive advantage in those industries. And it would be a great shame if we were to try and uh, shift that focus in search of employment generation alone. So that's my first point about Make in India. Second point, uh, is that uh, anything, uh, 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 you know, we, we're going beyond frugal, uh, one of the huge strengths we have in, in, in achieving that objective is the entrepreneurship in this country. So the government's, you know, startup uh, initiative, for example, is Broadly along, I mean, is addressing the right issues. We can debate whether the interventions that they have planned are the right ones. But the reality is that whereas 20 years ago, uh, it, was, it was too early to expect fundamental innovation to happen onshore in India. And at that time, with the IT revolution and so on and so forth, we really started with the body shopping business. Today, the combination of this technological sophistication, you know, uh, sophisticated engineering force uh, uh, and entrepreneurship means that it is possible to contemplate innovations being done or being uh, nurtured in India that will have global application. And uh, uh, so that's a huge strength uh, that we have, that very few countries actually have. It seems to me that it is very important for us to nurture. And this brings me to the third point on financial services. And financial services, interestingly, is, a, is an example of where uh, these various strengths of ours and our historical you know, uh, evolution actually come together to produce some very, very interesting results. Setting up a new bank um, in 2016 uh, is really a, quite a fascinating uh, venture. Um, and what we are trying to do at IDFC Bank is ride on the back of incredible innovation um, and technological deepening that has happened in the country over the last two decades. So, it is now possible to contemplate a different type of bank because we have 2G, 3G, now 4G connectivity that is becoming much more ubiquitous. It is possible to contemplate a different type of bank today because of the Aadhaar-enabled um, KYC uh, that has now become possible, right? Uh, I don't know how many of you are familiar with the work of NPCI. Um, NPCI is the National, National Payments Corporation of India. It's only 10 years old. But what they have managed to develop in terms of the payments and settlements infrastructure around the country is nothing short of extraordinary. So we are now moving, and they just announced a new initiative uh, a week ago. Uh, it's uh, UPI. It's really uh, interoperability, 
Um, the concept is that uh, uh, because of uh, technological innovation, it will now be possible for India to leapfrog in how payments are made and money is transferred person to person. We are moving rapidly to a mobile first financial services system. We are going to make branches irrelevant faster than any other country in the world. Uh, so my point is that um, in financial services over the next five years, thanks to technological in innovation and belatedly regulatory change and evolution, it is actually possible to contemplate an architecture of service delivery that would be revolutionary um, in its scale compared to anywhere else in the world. And if we can create that ecosystem in India, we have a lot that we can offer to the rest of the world. Thanks, Rajiv. I, I just want to uh, share a, a few examples. And I wish there were many more such as, and some of them are examples of companies that I, I know very, very closely. So let me start with an example of pharmaceuticals. And since October 2000, I've been a member of the board and of the audit committee and other committees of Dr. Reddy's laboratories. In October 2000, when I joined the board, the company made its first major, uh, not entry, but a, but a huge um, burst into America by getting the license to sell at a license expiry period, there was a period of 180 days where the innovator and the next guy could de deal with the market before everyone came in, to, to sell fluoxetine. And it did huge amounts of revenue for Dr. Reddy's. Fast forward today, uh, and you are seeing a Dr. Reddy's, you're seeing Sipla, you're seeing Sun, and you're seeing, uh, you know, Definitely these three, and, and now Sun is also, Ranbaxy is a part of Sun, and a few others, who are the major suppliers of top class generics. And we are not talking of, we are not talking of low level generics. Low level generics are no longer supplied by these companies. We are talking of very complex generics which are being supplied for therapeutic areas which were not hitherto ever uh, met by Indian pharmaceutical industries to the exacting standards of US FDA. But it's not just that. It's not just dealing with small molecule, complex small molecule generics. Today, we are supplying biologics. We are supplying not just Dr. Reddy's, but several others. There are. Today, India is a large supplier in, in economy, in countries which allow for biologics, is a large supplier of anti-cancer drugs, which have much greater efficacy and can be sold at a price significantly lower than the original guy. So it makes for better care across the world and at more affordable prices. The auto component business has been talked about. Because we grew the automotive business in India, we have developed huge amounts of technological skills in auto components. The third area where I think there is enormous capability is actually in IT, not just in the work that large IT companies such as Wipro, TCS, or Infosys do, but in terms of using the power of IT to productize and give services where you get a share of the income because you're developing a service for consumers at a far, far, far better way and in a far better delivery. And we have, we have enormous amounts of young talent, and I have a very simple rule about this. The only guys who can do this have to have long hair, have to be scruffy, 
and have to occasionally forget to have a bath, and they're fine. They're just brilliant in doing it. If you wear a tie and go into such a place, you are a no-no, you'll probably, you know, bankrupt the company, right? So, so there, there are three that immediately come to mind. However, hi, Amitav. Come, come, come sit. Thanks for, thanks for making it. I call it no, no, not at all, not at all. Well, I've already explained why you were late. Yeah. So, but, so these, are, these, are, these are very clear examples where if you were to compare even 10 years ago, I was talking of pharmaceuticals, I was talking of IT, but more than, more than body shopping IT, the stuff that is happening in IT services of various kinds, I was talking of auto ancillaries, where we have actually gone into a different level of quality. But let me raise two questions, and then the floor is there for Amitav, which is this. Question number one is logistics. To the extent that we want to be high up on the value chain, in manufacturing products, whether they are end products or even more importantly, whether they are uh, whether they are in the middle of the value chain, very high end, very high end products which customers all over the world demand, we need to have outstanding logistics. Have you? How many of you have seen the Shanghai port? Have any of you seen the Shanghai port, the port of Shanghai? Yeah, so if you just see the four major ports on the Chinese eastern seaboard, or the port in Singapore, yeah, and see the amount of TEUs that are handled every day, the speed of turnaround of cargo containers, how quickly they birth, how quickly they load, how quickly they unload, and the entire logistic chain that goes in to make this thing work. We have to really, and to me, it is not going to be a constraint to go up high value manufacturing or high value, services is a different matter, but to go up high value manufacturing, whether it be for end products or for intermediates, the constraint is not going to be capital. The constraint is not going to be physical resources such as land. The constraint is certainly not going to be entrepreneurship. The biggest constraint is physical infrastructure, not even power. The biggest constraint is the physical infrastructure of transportation to ports, airports, and from ports and airports. This, whether it be by rail, whether it be by road, the idea of creating a multi-modal transport business where you can always have just-in-time delivery and both of your output and of your input, which while possible for auto ancillaries around, uh, around in India now, we are still very far removed from that. So that's the first point, that if there is a constraint, the constraint lies in the state of highways, the constraint lies in our railway systems, the constraint lies in the speed at which things are, come out and go into ports. The second is an issue which Rajiv talked about, which I think we need to think. Because at the end of the day, we are talking of a country called India. Every year, one point, two crore people, 12 million young people enter the workforce. And this rate of 1.2 crore people will continue over the next 15 to 18 years, right? Now, everything that you see today, and all of you are in manufacturing or involved in manufacturing, everything that you see today in manufacturing as well as high value added services is labor saving. Today, more than ever before, you can get machinery, top of the line machinery for your factory 
at prices that you couldn't think of earlier, which create a throughput and a productivity which you couldn't dream of before, at, again, an overall cost that you couldn't think of before, and use one-tenth, certainly one-fifth, even one-tenth of the labor force for that line. So what you are, and obviously if I'm an entrepreneur, the IRR, the internal rate of return on that, is way superior to anything else. So if you were to look across all the industries and selected services, for instance, in IT services, everybody is talking of non-linearity. What does non-linearity mean? Non-linearity means that for every incremental $100 that I produce, I will use far less than before on labor cost, right? That's not because I'm going to pay people less, but because I'm going to automate a much larger section of the work that I do and use people more creatively, but I will not hire as many people as before, incrementally. And this is where we have a question. If you were to look, and Amita will vouch for this, is if you would look at the thing that we economists call employment elasticity, which simply means percentage increase in employment for a percentage increase in output, okay? What is the percentage increase in employment for a percentage increase in output? If you look at that, across all, virtually all industries, the employment elasticity is not only less than one, which means that for a 1% increase in output, you have less than 1% increase in employment. But actually, in many cases, across many industries, it's negative. That is, as output is increasing, the amount of incremental employment is decreasing in these industries. So if I were to superimpose that scenario with 1.2 crore people coming into the workforce every year of a, an employable age who are regrettably, majority are regrettably because of our historical antipathy to creating good education, good technical training institutions, good vocational training, who, have, who are unable for no fault of their own to be sufficiently educated and sufficiently skilled for tomorrow's world, then we can have a situation where we will certainly make an India, we'll make an India better than before, we will go up the value chain better than before, we'll be much more sophisticated in manufacturing as well as in services, but relatively speaking, at the margin, we will also employ less than before. That carries with it a consequence of politics and political economy which one would need to think about and need to think about how to deal with it as we go forward. Amitav, please. Uh, Umka, you made a number of very relevant and very valid points. and uh, These are very critical issues. and uh, To my mind, we must understand that we are in a globalized world and uh, India has to be a very integral part of the global supply chain. And uh, this really means that, uh, you know, if you want to be a part of the global supply chain, you have to become a very efficient country. So you have to be cost competitive and productivity levels must rise. You can't afford that in the long run, this country will keep protecting you. It's not feasible anymore. So productivity levels in India must rise, and they must rise very substantially. Uh, this has happened across all countries which have grown post-World War II. When China grew from 7.1 to 10.1 decade, it grew at 7.9. The next decade, it grew at 10. Point, uh, at one decade, it grew at 7.1, and the next decade, it actually grew at 10.9 percent. And the productivity levels actually accounted for 75 percent uh, increase in their growth. So total factor productivity is a very, very critical issue. And to my mind, total factor productivity must improve in India. That's very important. And this means that India must bring in reforms in its labor laws. It must bring reforms in its uh, ability to raise 
uh, resource it at very low rates of interest, and therefore the bond market must grow. It must bring in resources. It must bring in very radical resources in its uh, land pooling or land reforms policies. Uh, you can't live with antiquated laws which are designed for 1970s and for a different socialist era. You are living in a very, very competitive world, and this must happen. Secondly, uh, logistics you talked about, and logistics are going to be extremely critical. The cost of movement of goods in India are very, very high, and these are very high for two major reasons. One is goods produced in the northern part of India take 14 days to reach the ports on the western coast of India. Fortunately, by 2018 beginning, you will have the dedicated freight corridor, which will put goods uh, into the ports within 14 hours, so there will be a paradigm shift from 14 hours to 14 from 14 days to 14 hours. I think the same thing will happen with Amritsar Calcutta corridor, which will, uh, and the Chennai Bangalore corridor. So, in my mind, these new corridors, uh, new freight corridors which are coming up uh, for railways are going to be a very critical factor in improving logistic efficiency in India. The basic problem in India has been that we've not thought big, we've not thought large in terms of big multimodal logistic hubs. Unless you don't have large logistic hubs which enable your goods to be put right into the port, right into the port. From the production place, your trains move straight into the ports. What we've done over the years is to create small ICDs at several places. And ICDs at several places have left to a very inefficient movement of goods and services. And therefore, India requires huge, huge multimodal logistic hubs right into the port. And this is what has happened in Hong Kong. This is what has happened in Shanghai. The third point I want to make is that there is a need for agglomeration. Unless that doesn't happen, it's very difficult. We're doing a Virinium port right now in South to counter, uh, to counter Colombo as a port. And right We've just approved it on uh, viability gap funding, which is being developed by Adani. And a month later comes another proposal that we're going to do another port about 30 kilometers away uh, in Tamil Nadu. I mean, this doesn't happen anywhere in the world. What happens in the rest of the world is that they plan for one port, which is large, big, huge, which is going to cater to traffic in that entire region. You know, uh, you don't cannibalize projects. You look at, you need to. So India, in its infrastructure strategy, needs to think big, think large, focus on one thing, and just go in for that and attack that in a large manner to enable a huge amount of consolidation around that port. And that will help enhance uh, uh, productivity in a very big way. So three, four points. One is total fact factor productivity must rise. Uh, I think the new corridors will help, but we need to link these corridors to large multimodal logistic hubs, and I think uh, fourthly, we must allow consolidation around infrastructure, focus on few infrastructure projects, but plan big, plan large, plan go all out to create world-class world infrastructure as far as few, few infrastructure projects are concerned. Uh, the other point that was being made was about uh, the inevitability of uh, uh, manufacturing becoming more and more uh, digitized, and this is inevitable. This is inevitable, whether you call it smart manufacturing or manufacturing 4.0. Uh, let me tell you, every single company of the world is going to become digitized. Uh, you know, it, all manufacturing companies will become more and more digital in nature. And this is, this is just, the, uh, just because it's going to give enhanced efficiency, it'll give enhanced productivity, it'll give enhanced profits to manufacturing. And around the world, the world of robots, the world of uh, linking consumer, retailer, supplier, uh, and the production place has all integrated itself on basis of real-time decision making depending on what the consumer wa wants. And depending on what the consumer wants is relayed back down straight to the sh shop floor. And actually, fashion manufacturing, which used to be very dark, dirty and dangerous has become extremely fashionable and se sexy now because it's become very, I mean, if you go to a Tesla factory, it doesn't look like a manufacturing space at all. I mean, Elon Musk sits in the floor space right there. 
and it's actually a digital company doing manufacturing of the most fanciest cars in the world today. That's how manufacturing has evolved now, and this is going to happen everywhere. If you, I mean, all across the world, this is a huge revolution taking place, and India must embrace that. India must embrace that with all its might before it bypasses us. Several revolutions have bypassed us, but India must have the foresight and vision to embrace smart manufacturing. India has a huge competitive strength in terms of its digital technology. If it embraces that, it's possible for India to emerge as a great manufacturing nation simply because of its convergence and integration of smart manufacturing and intelligent manufacturing with the process of manufacturing. This revolution must be led by the large companies and passed on to the small and medium enterprises. And uh, this, this change is inevitable. But having said that, let me tell you that uh, while the nature of jobs may decline in the initial course, the kind of jobs, the kind of jobs which will grow, which will happen, will be far greater, many more of high value nature. And therefore, the total unit value realization that India will earn through this embracing of this new technology will be of a very different kind and will enable people to earn much more and much higher in terms of total value. Uh, you know, but it's also important to look at India in its totality. India is a very large country. It's not like, uh, it's not like uh, Sweden or not like Finland or uh, not even like Germany. India is bigger than 24 countries of Europe. And therefore, uh, to my mind, we need to have core competency of different kinds in different states. Uh, so if this kind of smart manufacturing revolution will happen in Gujarat and Maharashtra, it's feasible for, you to, for us to do it. There are areas, there are geographical areas in India where we need to excel in textiles, garments, apparels, food processing. And these are areas which have the possibility. I mean, there's no reason why India should lose the garment market to Bangladesh. So these are areas where India can create large-scale jobs. You can put up a garment factory in exactly five to six months. And Indian manufacturers are now going across to Bangladesh to establish garment factories. They've gone across to Ethiopia to uh, to make garment factories simply because the policy framework is not right. And therefore, you need a, a forward-looking free trade agreement with Europe. You need a better turnaround time at your ports, make your ports far more efficient to enable India to re-emerge as a great garment and textile manufacturing nation. I also feel that uh, different states will have different core competencies, and therefore, uh, you know, Karnataka and Andhra will excel in different ways. Kerala, for instance, there's no reason why it should become a great manufacturing nation. It should become a great tourism destination. But at the end of the day, it's important for India if it needs to grow and accelerate its speed of growth to 9 to 10 percent per annum for the next three decades. It's important that India, you know, there's very, very critical that India has 12 champion states, 12 champion states growing at 10 percent plus. And if we are able to provide push this limit of states emerging as champions of growth, you'll see India growing. Thanks, Amitav. I, uh, I want to claw back some time. So I think we'll put things to question to the house. Please um, keep your questions short. I have one humble request. Requests in India are always humble, uh, which is that uh, Please make it a question and not a long thesis. And uh, we will. And please say who you are directing the question to. And let's have, for the next ten minutes, a nice, solid discussion. I think enough has been said from here. Questions. Thank you, sir. You people are great, I think. The, he's doing a great job, you know. And I tell you, I want to share with you, because I, I have been living in the United States for 45 years. I think I'm very proud of the Indian. Anyhow, but the minds, this thing is a great thing, what you're doing. And I think we can manufacture everything. And I think now the time has come, which I feel in my mind, and I, you people are learned people, Call the consciousness, consciousness. How to live consciously, that came from India, which our gurus and, you know, all the learned people, just like when the Arjuna was attacking. Sir, may I ask you what the question is? Question is that I think manufacturing is great. 
I'd like to share with you that we need to get another subject if we can share that, the, that we need to teach people in all over the world. I should, yes. I think that's a very good point. And, sir, and I apologize. I will, no, I will, I will certainly ask Mr. Munjal to have a session on consciousness. It's Thank a very you, good sir. Time. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, yes. Yes, the gentleman in the back. Thank you, sir. I like the idea of. Uh, uh, you Mr. might want sorry. to stand if you don't yeah. want to be. If you want to be visible. Uh, yeah, <clears throat> I very much like the idea of which just put forth by Mr. Khan that different states have to specialize on the different production and services processes. So, in that context, what I would like to request Mr. Khan to tell us is where he sees our northeastern states. Thank you. You know, first, I wanted to respond uh, to the gentleman and raise the first question. I want to just say that uh, actually, you know, there's a very different energy and vibrancy and dynamism as far as the young India is concerned. And I've been very closely working with the startup movement in India. And uh, I mean, it's a totally different India. So a lot of Indians are taking a huge amount of risk. There's a lot of innovation going on in India right now. Actually, in many ways, India has become the center for research and development for many multinationals across the world in Bangalore and uh, uh, in Bangalore and Hyderabad. So uh, plenty of things happening in India. Uh, as far as the uh, Northeast is concerned, I'm a great believer in sustainability. And my belief is uh, that uh, Northeast needs to, uh, you know, develop as a very, very sensitive, high value tourism destination. It's possible to do this. It's, it's a unique, uh, destination. It just needs good connectivity. Uh, it needs to push a lot of local entrepreneurship. Uh, it needs to go back to its roots. Just don't ape the West. Don't ape the rest of India. Just go back to its traditional culture, its traditional art, its traditional architecture, and its uh, traditional cuisine. And Northeast can be one of the greatest and the most exotic and the most fascinating tourism destinations anywhere in the world. It's truly unique. That's number one. Number two is that uh, don't ever make the mistake of developing it as an industrial destination. Uh, you know, it's not cut out to be an industrial destination. One of the tragedies is uh, too much of cement investment going on right now. Uh, but the important point about Northeast is forget it, forget about connecting it to India. Connect Northeast to the rest of Southeast Asia, and you'll see Northeast, it should become far easier to for people to move from Northeast to Southeast Asia and vice versa, and you'll see Northeast growing and blossoming. So connectivity, uh, great tourism destination by creating its unique flavor, and uh, to my mind, uh, just doing good promotion and marketing of the destination, and pushing for local entrepreneurship. Absolutely right. Yes, sir. The gentleman in the middle. You referred in your address that uh, uh, therapy for cancer is getting uh, available to the world at par economical price. But nevertheless, uh, can we have few organizations work together in research on oncology, oncology in order to see that, yes, they we are. fight cancer together yeah. rather than individually in one pharmaceutical company? Well. There are two ways of working together. One is, uh, it's, unlikely, it's unlikely that um, several pharmaceutical companies will work together for oncological products, not immediately, primarily because of intellectual property issues. Uh, so, but having said that, there's an enormous amount of stuff that is already available in uh, oncological products from Indian pharmaceutical companies. Just give you an example. If you are having, um, if you are going through chemotherapy, then almost always between two chemotherapy sessions, you need something to bring your strength back on, and to prevent other infections, and it's called pegfilgrastim. Okay. Uh, up to seven years ago. Peg filgrastim could only be used by the super rich because it had to be imported. And you needed, uh, three days after your chemotherapy, you needed for four consecutive days an injection of 
which is one file, one file uh, for four days in order to bring your immunities back. And only the rich could use Philgaston. Today, there are three companies that produce world-class spec Philgaston, which they not only sell in India, but they sell in many other parts of the world. Now, as far as working together to do oncological research, I think some of it is already happening, not so much in the pharmaceutical space, but in figuring out how to do delivery. And, and the most important thing is delivery. I mean, I, just to give you an example, I don't know if you read yesterday's newspaper, and this is exactly the kind of thing Indians can do. It so happened that it's, well, it so happened that one person in the team was Indian, and it, and it happened to be in the Nanyang University in Singapore. Okay. And it's really fascinating. You, normally, how do you do chemotherapy? You um, basically inject the thing by drips over a three-hour period or a four-hour period through your veins. Now, these guys have figured out how to create microspheres, my, absolutely nanospheres. Huh? In the sphere is the chemo that you're going to use. But coated around the sphere are nanoparticles of iron, very nanoparticles of iron. So you've got a tiny, tiny sphere of iron inside which is the chemo. You shoot the thing, and as soon as you finish doing that, you actually use a magnet to draw the, it quickly to the area where you want it, instead of it getting lost on the way. And once it gets to the area which you're scanning and seeing that it is, you then do a minor, it's like a pulverization, but it doesn't, you don't feel anything, where you pulverize the iron and let that get released. And it's an amazing thing. They've just started it, and there's an Indian in it. This is exactly the kind of things that we can do in India as a part of it. So I, I do believe that India is going to be quite a lot in the cutting edge on oncology. Yeah, let me just add a couple of uh, points to that. Uh, so one is that uh, as important as it is to develop the drugs, it's also important to, for the scanning process itself. India has about 120, 130 pets, uh, whereas that number should be anywhere between 2,000 to 5,000. Now, one of the things which are deterring that is that you have a pet CT which is manufactured at $2 million. If you have to import that, then the affordability of that is very, very limited. So, you know, as an example, GE has, you know, completely looked at the remanufacturing capabilities of pet and by a great design where the crystals of pets are, you know, done in an additive manner. We've been actually able to reduce the cost of a pet CT by 40-45%. And that has increased the penetration of pet CTs already by about 50% in the last year alone that we've launched it. So I think that's one. The second is, you rightly said, it's a partnership approach. So, you know, when we look at, you know, an overall treatment of oncology, it also has to have partners. So for instance, we've tied up, and I can see my friend Joe Nicholas here. So we've tied up with CTSI to bring oncology to Indian hospitals and give them an end-to-end -end suite of what is required. And when you look at value addition, and that's the key here, you should not only look at the one part of the chain that you impact. It is important to impact the multiple parts of the chain so that the outcome is affected. And I think that's what, you know, all of us need to do uh, to impact the outcome. Okay, we'll take one last question. I'm afraid yours is the last question. I, we've run out of time. Sorry, sir. Yours is the last question. And, uh, and then we'll quickly... Um, my name is Ajay Mutreja. Uh, this question is from Amitabh Kant. I have been involved in bringing foreign technologies to India for the last 30 years, and I've seen the technology revolution. Uh, if we are looking at employability, uh, there is no way we can look at anything that is similar to any China model that Rajiv was talking about. Or if we are looking at cluster approach and trying to see which 12 states of our country can focus on 
accelerating our growth, I think we are very far behind. We have to first create the ecosystem of all ancillaries in each of those clusters revolving around specific industries. So Amitabh, my question to you is, do we even know which clusters are we going to focus on? Where is India's competency on manufacturing? I'm not talking of financial services for the time being. You know, uh, uh, first of all, I think uh, we should just forget about comparing ourselves with China. You know, most of the people who've been to China or worked in China just start comparing India with China. We're two different ball games. We function under very different uh, kind of political systems. And uh, what's feasible in China is just not feasible in India. Uh, it's very, very important for all of you to understand this. But having said this, let me uh, tell you that it's uh, very few countries of the world are capable of uh, combining technology, innovation, and skill uh, the way India has been able to do. Uh, the kind of entrepreneurship which India has is truly top class. I mean, China just doesn't have that kind of top class private entrepreneurship which India has. Uh, it's, to my mind, I mean, we demonstrated this again and again, and Mangalyan is just one example of it. But I mean, why is it that a company like Renault in its 118 years history, uh, which has never manufactured a car outside Europe, comes and does uh, a complete innovation design, manufactures a car for the entire global market uh, called the Renault Quid from India and is today exporting 65% of its production from India. There's something unique about it. Why does the jet chopper on which the American president flies, which used to be manufactured in Japan by Mitsubishi, gets relocated to Hyderabad and is being manufactured here in India for all the planes today? There's something unique about it. Uh, why is it that Hyundai came into India looking at the domestic Indian market and is today exporting 68% of its production to 123 countries of the world? There's something different about India there. And why, why is it that GE manufactures an ECG machine in America for 18,000 US dollars and is able to do it for 2,000 dollars in India uh, here and is able to do an ECG for $1? There's something unique about it. So India is one of the rare few countries which has the ability to combine technology, innovation, and skill. So don't run down India all the time. And India has demonstrated this in auto components. India has demonstrated this in automobile. India has demonstrated this in a vast range of areas, including pharma. I think, I think it's time to, put, to, to call an end to the session. The general takeaway are this, are these. One, we certainly have it in us to do much better manufacturing, much more sophisticated manufacturing, much more world-class manufacturing, and still do it at a price which makes sense for consumers in this country, and do it subject to significant improvement in our logistics to be a supplier to the world market. The game has started, and there is huge upside in it. Second is there is no lack of skills in this country. We have a huge amount of skills, and if you want to see it straight away, you can not only see it in R&D, in, in pharmaceuticals, you can see it in IT, you can see it in IT services, you can see it in several modern manufacturing, and you can see it in all manner of service sector industries and young people coming up everywhere. Third, is there is an issue going forward about how this juxtaposes with uh, the number of people coming into the labor force because we need to somehow get them juxtaposed. It's not going to happen immediately, but we've get, got to get there. And that's a much harder task. It's not a task of manufacturing. It's a task of education and training, where while we have done well in manufacturing and we are uh, on the right path, we are quite removed on education and training, and we really have to get our act together. All in all, the time for, time for manufacturing in India has come. If we don't do it this time, let us not have a discussion 20 years later why we didn't. Thank you very much. Thank you, gentlemen. Can we have a huge round of applause for this fabulous session? Very insightful.
I would request none other than Mr. Shrikant Somani, Chairman and Managing Director, Somani Ceramics, to kindly grace the stage and present a memento to our esteemed panelists. Can we have a round of applause, please? First and foremost, would request Mr. Kant to kindly come in the center, sir. Thank you, sir. <laughs> Dr. Rajiv Bilal. Come on, ladies and gentlemen, we can do better. Let's. Mr. Milan Rao. And of course, our fabulous moderator, Mr. Omkar Goswami. Thank you, sir. Thank you, gentlemen.